We interrupt this record to bring you a special bulletin. The reports of a flying saucer hovering over the city have been confirmed. Did you really go out with an alien? Uh-huh. What was it like? Real different. Becoming Human, a Mork and Mindy podcast. Previously on Becoming Human. Gosh, you're just like one of us. <laughs> Yeah, but Daddy, he never does organ things anymore. Like he completely stopped drinking with his finger. Oh, that's an old planet custom, huh? If anyone can possibly retrain Mork in organ ways, it's the ancient one. You could find out what you're like from other people who knew you before. Yeah, you mean like ask my friends? Of course. One person isn't an accurate sampling. Pull your friends for an in-depth profile. <laughs> that's an excellent idea, Lola. I have a problem. I'm, I'm, I'm taking a little opinion poll. Do you remember what I was like before? You don't want to know that. Uh, well, I always thought you were fun, uh, kind of unpredictable, silly. Goofy. Primo. No, no, I meant, uh, nice Goofy. Oh, I see. Goofy with a side of nice. <laughs> <laughs> little restaurant humor. Yeah. <laughs> Spontaneous. That's what Mindy wants from me. She wants... Are you really spontaneous? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Nelson, let's skip dinner and dune buggy to the border. Yes! <laughs> oh, that's it. Nick, do! This isn't you. Don't you see? You're being too obvious. It's not going to fool the elder. Man. He's older than I thought. <laughs> Your eminence. This is one of the instances where the subtitles on the DVD don't even bother to translate beyond speaking Orkin. Mork goes over to Mindy and says that the Elder is speaking some kind of foreign language. Mindy thinks it's probably Orkin. Mork says, oh, of course, and he chuckles. The Elder says something else in Orkin. Mindy wonders what he's saying. Mork was hoping she would know. She asks Mork if the Elder speaks English. Mork slowly shouts, do you speak English? And then he says, habla dinero, like do you speak money in Spanish? The Elder tunes his head and then he says that he can speak speak any language he chooses. Mindy doesn't understand. Work said someone very old was coming. She asks the elder how old he is. He says seven microblooms were in earth years and he calculates on his hand. That comes to 86. So yes, the bloom thing does not make any sense, including in this episode. Micro just means very small. It's not a specific amount, so I don't know how much a micro bloom is. Seven does not go in evenly into 86. You do the math. Mindy is still confused because the elder looks like a 10-year-old kid. Mork says on Orc, the aging process is reversed, kind of like Dick Clark. So reference to the host of American Bandstand, who still looked very young in the early 80s, even though he had been hosting a pop music music show since the 50s. I had wondered about this in the first two seasons when the Orkin aging thing comes in. And this is definitely retconning what is suggested in those first two seasons. But this is what I remembered. What had stayed with me all these years was that Orkin's age backwards. I think that this episode really did make a big impression on me compared to some other episodes for various reasons. Partly that it was the season opener, it was longer, Fred was back, just a lot of reasons, including probably waiting longer to see my shows because of that strike. But yeah, they age backwards and that will lead to some complications for the next couple seasons. 
The elder explains that they're born in a test tube, fully grown, gray-haired, and wrinkled. He takes his glasses off. Again, this thing with glasses, and I think this is to be more serious. He says that way they're treated with respect on day one. And Morx's and baby shoe bronzing is really expensive. The elder says as they grow old, they continue to look younger. Morx says they get smaller and cuter. That way, all the people want to keep their old folks at home. But apparently, they don't respect them. <laughs> Except that clearly they do respect the elder, so it doesn't really make sense. Mindy thinks that's nice in a weird sort of way. The elder wants to get on with the training. Mindy backs away as the elder takes out a metallic device and points it at Mork. He scans it over Mork, who reacts as if he's getting a massage or something even more intimate, the way that Robin Williams plays this. According to the meter, Mork is only 17% Orkin. Can't even imagine what that'd be like if he were zero. If Mork is not a full Orkin, by the time the Elder is finished here, Mork will be ostracized. And Mork says, oh no, the disgrace, the shame, and the Shonda of it all. Shonda is Yiddish for shame and disgrace. The thing of Orkin language being somewhat like Yiddish, although it's possible he picked that up on Earth. And the worst part is to be purple. Not just purple, but purple in winter. And purple doesn't go well with goosebumps. So I guess winters on work are pretty cold. Um, is, is there anything I, I can do to help? You've done enough, culture sapper. Go away. What? Wait a minute, Buster. This is my house. Who do you think you are? My name is... <laughs> I beg your pardon. Uh, I think he said his name was... <laughs> what a rude planet. You've turned him into an Earthling. Now leave us alone so I can put the orc back in Mork. So this is one of these moments where there's a bit of a showdown with the Elder and other people. In this case, it's Mindy. And we've seen many episodes where Mindy has a righteousness about her, is standing up for people. And of course, she cares deeply about Mark, so she's going to stand up here. We get the running joke of the Elder having a name that is basically what would be called in comedy a raspberry. And we can see that this is one of those scenes where Mark and Mindy are united either by touching each other or their body language. Language. And yes, we of course get the title drop of putting the orc back in Mork. Mork says that Mindy meant no harm, and he calls the elder your eminence, which seems to be the title, like your highness, for a king. And that's what Mork and after a while Mindy refer to him as, although a few times they call him by name. The elder says that Mindy robbed them of an orkin, and Mindy thinks that the elder's right. She guesses that she's done enough already, and she'll just go and wait in the room, and she gestures at her bedroom. She wishes Mork good luck. He says big kiss, but she pushes his face away and says not right now. She exits, and he waves. Mork tells the elder that he feels really bad for Mindy. The elder says orcans do not have feelings, and he calls Mork an infidel. The elder says they'll begin with something basic, and he tells Mork to hit his head against the wall. Mork salutes him and says, right. <laughs> I do not know any Libyans, and I have not yet cashed the check. <laughs> How did I do? Incorrect. You did not say Shazbot. Oh. Again. <laughs> Shazbot. Ha, ha, ha. I would have lost. It was my thyroid. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. Huh? Pain first. Shazbot second. <gasps> I can see why you're the elder. <laughs> Again. Oh, let's move Laverne and Shirley to Thursday night, okay? The reference to Libyans is very timely. I believe that refers to the scandal where John C. White, chairman of the Democratic National Committee, was involved in an alleged bribery scheme to allow the sale of United States warplanes to Libya. I'm looking at a New York Times article from November 10th, and this episode aired on November 13th, but of course the scandal had been going on for a while that fall. I vaguely remember it. And we learned that you must say Shaw's bond after the pain, not before. Howard, of course, is yet another reference to Howard Cosell. I'm not sure which athlete Mark is imitating. It may just be a generic athlete. And yes, I treasured the reference to moving Laverne and Shirley to Thursday nights because, of course, that, as I talked about before, impacted the ratings for Laverne and Shirley and, of course, Mark and Mindy because they had had their Thursday slot that they had to struggle to get back to. We're still feeling the effects of it in the 1980-81 season. 
I won't go into detail on this, but Mork and Mindy was definitely not the only series that was changing things around. And Laverne and Shirley famously moved to Burbank with the entire regular cast, partly because the ratings were so bad. So of the Laverne and Shirley references on this series, I thought that that was the most satirical. And of course, he's mocking the network executives who had probably changed in the interval because it was a time of a lot of firing and changing up top as well. We get another nighttime exterior and there are three small eggs circling the house now. Mindy is in the same outfit as before and she's standing in the living room with Fred. So I assume she called him again and updated him on the situation. Fred says, you mean there's really another orkin up there? She says it's crazy. They've been unloading a whole fleet of cargo eggs and taking strange looking stuff into the attic. And I have to say that we can hear some sounds of construction and things moving around, but I don't know if it's just the DVD edit. It didn't really seem that disruptive. So Mr. Bickley showing up later doesn't make all that much sense. Not that I mind seeing Mr. Bickley usually. Despite everything else that is going on, the part that Fred can't get over is that there's another orc in. And of course he wasn't around for the Necrotons. So this is probably a pretty big deal to him. And he says, you're living with two orcans? It's not like the Elder moved in. I mean, it's only been a few hours. She says, oh, dad, if Mork fails his orkin training, I'll never forgive myself. Fred calls her honey and says that Mork will make it. And he says that Mork is doing this for her, which is true. Much of what Mork does is for Mindy. And this is definitely an example of that. He says that Mork will be the same fella he used to be. So I think even though he enjoyed the leisure suit wearing golfing Mork, he understands how important the original Mork is to Mindy. And he mentions Mork being out on the lawn shampooing caterpillars. So this is another thing with Mork and caterpillars or butterflies that seems to come up at least once a season. Mindy says she just feels so helpless. He's going through so much and she can't even be up there with him because that old coot won't let her. And I don't know if she explained to Fred about the aging thing. And then Fred says, well, honey, if Mork needs you, maybe you should be up there to help him. Mindy says, well, yeah, but I feel like an intruder in my own house. And who even knows what's arriving in those eggs? He says that she sounds like she's a little scared. She says she is, but she's scared from work, not for herself. He just might fail that test. Fred says it never hurts to bring an apple to the teacher, if you know what I mean. And she seems to know. I think it's like a catch more flies with honey kind of thing. He offers to go up there with her. She thanks him, but she says Mork is her alien. Like she's the one responsible for him. And then they both chuckle. He asks if she's sure, and she is. He kisses her on the cheek and says if she needs him, he'll be home hiding under the bed. Because I guess it's scary that another alien has come to town. And then he says humor, like when Mork says humor. And then they both bark laugh. And there's quick applause, and then he leaves. Fred isn't necessary to this episode, but again, I do like that she does have somebody that she can turn to for comfort and advice. As always, it's nice to see Conrad Janice and get that father-daughter relationship, and also, of course, seeing him interact with Mork earlier. She starts to head upstairs, but the elder stops her, and he descends the stairs. He says it's a pure Orkin environment up there, and she's not going to spoil it. She hesitantly does a raspberry, and the audience laughs and claps a little bit. She says they've got to have a little talk. She cares about Mork and wants him to be Orkin just as much as the Elder does. She thinks Orkins are great, terrific. He's just got to let her help Mork. She puts her hands on his shoulders, and he looks at one of her hands. She apologizes and removes her hands. He puts one of his own hands over his heart and says he can't take this excitement. He's not a young man anymore. He says she may go. She thanks him and does the backward step thing, kind of like the Three Stooges that Mark was doing earlier. The Elder does say that she mustn't contaminate what they have up there with her earthliness. So he says to put this on, and he hands her a doll size Orkin uniform. It's one size fits all. She dubiously excuses herself to change in her bedroom. There's a knock on the front door. The elder turns and heads down the stairs, saying, Up the stairs, down the stairs. This place is rough on old people. And he opens the door to Mr. Bickley. Mr. Bickley says, Oh, hello, you must be one of Mork's little friends from the daycare center. So he knows about Mork's job. And he asks the boy his name. And, of course, the elder does a raspberry. Listen, you little... <laughs> Leave here at once. This is no place for children. What are you, a wise guy? Very. How'd you like to go for a ride in my Cuisinart? 
So we get another face-off where they are treating each other like a child. And we get another Cuisinart reference. And then Mindy re-enters surprisingly quickly. And she is in the Orkin uniform, including gloves and boots somehow. She asks how she looks and then she notices Mr. Bickley. He says he came upstairs to complain about the noise. And he says, can't you play dress up more quietly? And he asks where they got the outfits. Fredericks of Mars? Lingerie or something? Pretty kinky remark to make to Mindy and this seemingly small boy. He laughs and exits, and there's some quick applause. The elder smiles and says they're cute at that age. And then more seriously, he says they should go. But he must warn her. Her upper level, meaning the attic, has been transformed into a world no earthling has ever seen before. He heads up, and she prepares to follow him. What's happening, my man? Looking good. I don't believe this place. Quiet. He's on the nano machine. Nano. Nano. Hi, boy. Oh, hi, man. Wrong. Nano. Big nano man. <laughs> he's firm, but he's fair. Oh, you look good in Orkin threads. Oh. I didn't know they made him in cadet. <laughs> What's happened to this place? You never even know we were in the attic. Griblich! Griblich? Oh, Griblich means he's on the break, man. Those elders have a tough union. <laughs> well, let me show you around. Oh, well, it's, it's really oh. fantastic. Oh, shucks. Look at that. What's that thing? Oh, that was Orkin words of wisdom. It'll come around again. See here, it says, Skriznik kum kushbaya, which means life is like a kushbaya. <laughs> Deep, huh? Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> <laughs> Let me show you a picture of where I grew up. <gasps> you mean this is what Orc looks like? Well, some of it. They tore most of it down to make swamps when they found out the earthquakes were allergic reaction to condominiums. <laughs> it's even prettier in the fall. It comes so quickly, too. <laughs> you too. There it goes. Oh. Uh, Amazing. Well, the artist is really fantastic. You should, you should see one of his sunsets. Here comes one now. Oh. Listen, men. Crickets. <laughs> Those are three moons of Orc. Lumpy, Squeezy, and Jojo. I really enjoyed the set design, and it shows how versatile that attic set is, and you can still see a little bit of brick to show us that this is where we are. They've got the Nanu Nanu machine. Mork and Mindy get kind of flirty with the cadet exchange about the outfit. I should mention that the elder, instead of saying the Nanu Nanu, pronounces it closer to Nanu Nanu with a flat A sound, more like the first season. So I wondered if maybe Nanu Nanu was something that evolved while Mork was on Earth. We find out that Griblich is going on a break, and and there's a little union joke, and we get the elder face sitting. We get the Orkin words of wisdom that translate to life is like a kushbaya, which will become a running joke. There's another condominium reference. We learn that the crickets howl like wolves, and there are three moons of orc, Lumpy, Squeezy, and Jojo, and we might have had that before. I feel like the number of moons changes, but I'm not tracking that. I'm sure someone is online. Mindy takes Mork's hand and asks if all of these things are helping him to become more orc-like. He says they sure are. All around him are things from home, especially his pet Naga Chomp. I don't know if Naga Chomp is like Naga Hide. We get Naga Hide a bit later in this scene. It's spelled differently. It's N-O-G-G-A Chomp. He says that's the number one pet on Orc, even more popular than the Cocker Frinkles. He thinks his is the cutest of all, and he calls to him. The Naga Chomp's name is Bebo. I think he likes you, man. He is, a friend or a munchie. Oh, no, no, don't worry, hon. They only eat hair and rugs. That's why political candidates on Orc have to be real careful. <laughs> so this is our first sight of Bebo, who is actually one of the most regular characters of season three. And I have an anecdote to tell you about him, but I will have to save that until we get into season four. There's a recurring thing here in the even into the closing credits where Bebo chases Mindy and Mork thinks this is a sign that Bebo likes her. Mindy is worried about whether Bebo likes her as a friend or as a munchie. The thing about eating hair or rugs in politicians, I guess he's implying that politicians are more likely to wear toupees. So another politician hair joke. 
like with Reagan earlier, although he wasn't saying that Reagan wore a toupee. She has him call Bebo off. Mark says sometimes he doesn't know whether Bebo is coming or going. And as Bebo is at his feet, he says that he thinks Bebo is going to dance with him. And I kind of wondered if Bebo, who is listed as playing himself in the credits, I wondered if there was like a remote control and they didn't have too much control of it because it just kind of wanders around the stage. And I assume what the subtitles called burbling was added in post-production. I thought maybe that dance line was an ad lib. Mork calls Bebo boy, so Mindy thinks that Bebo's a boy, and Mork says he actually doesn't know because he's never had the nerve to turn Bebo over. I don't know what the difference is between male and female Nagachomps. I don't think we ever find out, but I think we're meant to perceive Bebo as male. The elder gets up and comes over to Mork, who calls him your eminence again. Now it's flash new, which means the break is over. Mork tells Bebo to take a hike, and Bebo exits, so at least he's fairly obedient. The elder says the next phase is that Mork will relearn his Orkin Pledge of Allegiance, and Mindy sits down in the pink chair to wait and probably stay out of the way. The elder tells Mork to put his hand over his hearts, and I think Orkins had three hearts? Is that what we learned in season one? Something like that. So Mork tries to cover all of them. He says, I pledge allegiance to my planet. The rest of the known universe can can it. Killer Nogahide, we call it the Sizzler. They probably thought you were a Malibu chicken. Trying to fry me. Oh, well, that's all right. You can only sit down if you have asbestos shorts. Well, <laughs> oh, you're safe now, though, me. No. Oh, get away from him. I feel like we had something else that was called the Sizzler, like an egg or some other device, maybe on the Necrotons episode. And yeah, it's made of Naga hide. We have Mork protecting Mindy, and they're hugging. And of course, the Elder disapproves of this. Mork tells the Elder that Mindy needs him. Mindy starts to say something, but the Elder freezes her. Mork says that she checked out and took the baggage too, which is one of those Robin Williams catchphrases I remember. I don't know if it was Mork specific, but I've definitely heard it elsewhere. He says that the Elder froze her. The Elder says, that Mork is more concerned about her than he is about being an Orkin. He says that it's no use. Mork's training can't help him. He's going back to Ork now. Mork says he can't leave Mindy. The Elder says he must. Mork says after all these years, Mindy will never know that he said goodbye. And he says big kiss and he kisses her. It hasn't been all these years. It's been two years and maybe a few months at most. After the commercial break, there's, of course, a nighttime exterior of the house. Mork says he can't leave Mindy. The Elder says they'll build Mork another one, a new advanced model with a power seat. I don't know if that was meant suggestively. The line was given to a child, but it is still a weird point in any case. Mork says there will never be another Mindy. The Elder says that he underestimates technology and they must go. Mork stutters that the Elder doesn't understand. The Elder says this is blasphemy. An Elder understands everything. You young people have no respect. Maybe if he wasn't so cute, they'd respect him more. Mork says he meant no disrespect and he calls him your foginess, like an old fogey. If he could only show the Elder what a Mindy is, Mork would kiss his tiny feet through his sensible boots. The Elder says all right, but be quick about it. See, what's different is that she has qualities that we Arkans don't have. That sometimes she's happy. <laughs> sometimes she's sad. <laughs> sometimes she's fun-loving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you kid. <laughs> sometimes she's inquisitive. Oh, well, how did you get your tongue through the keyhole? <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time, she's caring. She's caring. <laughs> She's really caring. Is something stuck? Yes, sir. Me on Mindy. <laughs> Strange concept. Yet it has such a hold on you. Oh, sir. <laughs> Nice little performance by Pam Dauber. Mork, of course, really enjoys the hugs, and he admits that he's stuck on her. Mork says that's why he's got to be an Orkin, so he can stay with her. She means more to him than anything in the known universe, which we learned on the Necrotons episode. Mork wonders if there's anything they can do. There must be something. The Elder says there is. Well, no, it's far too dangerous. Mork says he'll risk anything. He'll even shave with a live weasel. And this is not only another weasel reference, but I wondered if it was a reference to the Frank Zappa album, Weasels Rip My Flesh, which came out in 1970. The Elder says he hasn't done it in many bleams. Uh, he's micro bleams old, but he's done things many bleams ago. Yeah, okay, whatever. The Elder says it's horrendous, terrifying, a last result. He's too old to even consider it. But maybe with Mindy's help, 
and then he unfreezes her. The elder repeats that with her help, he can possibly do it. There's a remote possibility that the elder might be able to pull the earth spirits from Mork's body with the ritual of the sacred eggs. Oh, the ritual of the sacred eggs, man. Oh, gasp, joke. Extreme fear. Everything pulses through my body. Man, he's an exorcist. <laughs> So we get an exorcist pun, and I like the elder's sage nod. There's yet another exterior of the house. Seek off la goop. Seek off la goop. In tala tu. In tala tu. Vi gola zi tadap. Uh, vi gola zi tadap. With this ceremonial egg, I will attempt to remove the earth spirits from his body. I only hope I'm strong enough. Why? What's going to happen? It's not going to be pleasant. <laughs> well, wouldn't you feel more powerful if you were upstairs in your own environment? No. We must fight the earth vibrations off for their most powerful. That's why it's so dangerous. Earth behavior, be gone! <laughs> Are you all right? Mark's not here right now. Glory's the name, Earth features the game. What do you mean, my credit's no good, Lord? <laughs> Your grandma writes bad checks at Macy's. <laughs> The earth spirits won't let go of him. I must try harder. Be gone! Oh, oh, something get that thing away from him. Next time you get that name, there'll be to be pantyhose in there. Oh. Wow, what are you doing? Wow, you're, not, you're a gnarly little geek, aren't you? Bonjour! 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 No, no, no. Oh, for sure, for sure. Be gone! For sure. For sure. Oh, Be gone! Ah, no, give me a Twinkie! <laughs> No, hey, nice to be here in Vegas. Nice to be here in Vegas. Can I do I know what to say. Hey, are you sure you want to go for a ride on my belt? No, come here. I don't know, I don't care. Oh, what would this country be without this great land of ours? I don't know. I'm sorry, all I want is a condominium with a view. A condominium with a view. I shall return. I shall return. I shall return. You can't. They're just tapes. They're just tapes. I do I do I am. It's up to him now. Oh, no. Oh, Mark, please come back. Mark. Mark. No, 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 no. <gasps> My name is Mark. Oh, he's back. The oh, earthly Mark. spirits seem to have left. So there's a lot going on here. We have Mork on a purple table. Again, the thing of purple. Mindy is still dressed like an orchid, and she even has a similar robe to the elder. And she is repeating the orchid chants without really knowing what she's saying. But, you know, she wants to help. And we get Mork turning into a cat and a dog and a Native American. The finger from The Shining, which apparently is named Danny. I've never seen the movie. And the subtitles say that he is doing the bad checks line as Popeye, but I think it's actually he's trying to do Linda Blair. And there's a reference to the legs pantyhose, which came in an egg-shaped carton. L apostrophe eggs. And of course, Mark does a surfer and uses the word gnarly, which was more famous later in the 80s. There's a reference to, I believe, the Bonjour Jeans ad. And he says, for sure, maybe as a surfer. And again, for sure, we catch on more with the spread of Valley Girl Speak later in the 80s. 
course, he does his little kid voice, and of course, he's abusing a cat. And he's in Vegas for a bit, and then he's sort of a brainless politician asking what this country would be without this great land of ours. So I don't know if that was like a Nelson parody or just a generic politician. And yes, he becomes Nixon and refers to a condominium. And then, of course, the just tapes, referring to the Nixon tapes. And yeah, we get Auntie M, one of the many Wizard of Oz references on the show. On a less comedic note, we have Mindy just pleading for him to come back to be himself. When the lights come back on, Mindy helps works it up. She asks if he's alright, and he says in his Orkin voice that he had this horrible dream where his head spun around and he spat out Linda Blair, of course referring to the exorcist. She takes off his silver cap and lets out a gasp as she sees that his hair is growing back. He laughs joyfully and says he's back to his roots, so pun there. He does a happy dance, and he thanks the elder, calling him your geezerness. Mindy hopes that Mork is just the way he used to be. The elder says the orcometer will tell them that. Mork says, oh no, laughs nervously, and says there's no place like home, so another Wizard of Oz reference. The elder scans Mork. He's only 93% orcan. Mork failed. He must prepare to leave for Orc to be ostracized. Mindy cries, oh no, it can't be, and she runs over to Mork's side. Mork says they can't question the wisdom of an elder, and then he says, can we? And the elder says no. But then the elder collapses. Mork says that the, and then he does the raspberry, seems to have been knocked out of, and then he does the raspberry, and they kneel to examine him. There's yet another nighttime exterior of the house. Mindy is sitting on the couch with the elder's head in her lap, and she's put a cold compress on his head, and he's stretched out. Mork is standing. There's a pitcher of orange juice on the wicker chest. Mork says the elder said that the ritual would be dangerous, and yet he still did it for Mork. He says, and Mindy did it for him. Mindy says, and Mork did it for her. Mork says she did that for the elder, meaning she's taking care of him. And then Mork observes that life would be a lot simpler if they were more selfish. Mindy thinks they should get the elder to drink some juice. They help the elder sit up. Mindy puts ice in a glass, but then says, oh yeah, I forgot, as she sees that Mork is holding the elder up and putting his hand into the pitcher. Mindy is worried that the elder isn't drinking. She suggests fixing him some soup. Mork says the noodles would get caught in the elder's fingernails. The elder starts drinking quickly. Both Mork and Mindy are relieved. The elder wakes up and speaks in Orkin that Mork translates as, he'd like a daiquiri and what's your sign? Like they're in a singles bar. So we can see that because Mork is more Orkin, he now understands the language again. Mork takes the elder's hand out of the pitcher. Somebody starts drying the elder's hand with a paper towel. The elder says he was about to take Mork away and Mindy wanted Mork to stay. He wonders why Mindy helped him. She says that she had to. The elder needed someone. And this is an example of how Mindy is a good person. Even if it would have been to her benefit for the elder to not take Mork away, she can't abandon someone in pain. The elder says, as a wise elder, he's never uttered these words before. I don't get it. Mindy calls him your eminence and says that it's called caring. The elder says it's strong medicine and he's starting to realize what a Mindy is. So although this episode is about putting the work back into Mork, we also are reminded of who and what Mindy is. Mork says, well, at least the elder understands that and he's ready to leave. Mork stands. The elder stands too. He says Mork isn't a perfect orkin, and the rules say that he must take Mork home. Mork says rules are rules, sir. The elder says true, but you aren't playing the same game down here, meaning on earth. You both taught me that. I don't understand the puzzlement, a sense of disorientation, sir. Perhaps if you were any more orkin, you'd be of no use as an observer. You'd stick out, like me. You belong here. You mean he can stay? Yes, oh soft-lapped one. <laughs> so we get Mork doing his stage directions thing. The elder, although he's wise, he's also wise enough to realize that he can still learn something. And so he learned a lesson on Earth. The soft lap line is interesting. The elder was resting his head in Mindy's lap. But you can see by the way Robin Williams reacts that it's a little bit, not suggestive, but kind of like, hmm. And I, if I remember correctly, when the elder comes back, as he will, I think he does call her soft lap one again. So he remembers that. Mark says jubilation, shiksalation, upon unju and shiksa. And of course, we also know that shiksa is an orkin word. Mork goes around the room happily talking to plants, including his friend Fern. He does his back jack to the giant toy jack. 
he laughs triumphantly. He tells the chair to take it easy. He does his bark laugh. And Mindy looks delighted because Mork is definitely back to himself. Mork kisses the elder's ungloved hands. And presumably they don't taste like orange juice. He calls him your eminence again and thanks him. And then Mindy hugs the elder. The elder says he liked that. Mindy says it's a hug. The elder says it's an interesting concept. And he asks Mork why they don't have that on Orc. Mork says either they're too advanced or they don't want the Baptists to know that they're dancing. And I think it's a variation on the old joke, why don't Baptists have sex standing up? Because people might think they're dancing. And I don't know if I got that joke when I was 12. The elder starts heading towards the door and they follow him. He must go now if he's going to catch the next time warp. I'm not sure how this plays into egg travel, but maybe that explains how he got there so quickly. And also how Mork traveled back to the early 60s twice. He says if he should ever happen to be in the galaxy again, and then he asks if they would mind a visit from an old man, and I thought that was really sweet. Although he is visiting with their permission, they weren't thrilled that he had to make this visit. Now he regards them as friends, and Mindy says any time. Mork promises that they'll write, and Mindy jokes as soon as they learn how to spell, and then she does the raspberry, and then she smiles. Well, nanu nanu, or as you earthlings say, oh. His hug goodbye is very sweet, and I have to say that in their matching outfits, they kind of look like a family. I noticed that the egg is waiting for him. Obviously, it was not out in the hall when Bickley was there, so he must have somehow summoned it, or maybe it was scheduled at a particular time. Mork closes the door, and Mindy says it's nice to have him back. Just Mindy and me, and Bebo makes me. Mork! Mork! Oh, enjoy him now, Mind. They grow to be a hundred feet high. <laughs> You mean. <laughs> so this is a very cute, affectionate scene after all the drama. We get Bebo again, and it sounds like Pam Dauber actually laughing at the end of the scene. It just sounded really genuine. There's one last nighttime exterior of the house. Mark summons Orson. He's in the living room and he's wearing his uniform. And I kind of wondered, by the way, was he reporting during the time of his low Orkin levels? So maybe it was only a couple weeks because Orson seems really relieved that Mark is back. Mork has Bebo at his feet in the tag, and I think that went on through the rest of season three. Maybe not every episode, but I feel like there were other episodes. Mork calls Orson your grossness, your fatitude, your inner tubeness, and he says, oh, lard and master. And Orson says, oh, how I miss those words, Mork. Mork says, ha ha, sir, me too. Orson missed the fat jokes. Orson says, I'm glad to see you're back. Mork says, I'd be glad to see your back, sir, but your front folds around and covers it. Then he does his bark laugh. He tells Bebo that he has to zing Orson, and Bebo burbles, of course. Orson says this is music to his ears. His eminence, meaning the elder, told Orson what happened. It must have been quite an experience for Mork. Mork does his surfer voice and says it was a very heavy philosophical excursion, for sure. In his regular voice, he says, After much difficulty, he found the tree of him. Orson thinks this is good and asks where he found it. Mork says it was in the forest of us, down the path of change where the squirrels of self hide the nuts of inner peace. I'm not sure if this is a reference to like some sort of hippie philosophy. I don't remember hearing the tree of me or the forest of us in another context. Orson says, in other words, life is like a kushbaya. And worked as a bunch of evangelistic yeses. And he says in that same voice, come on home, mama, take anything you need, which is another Mork catchphrase and or Robin Williams catchphrase. Mork wants to thank Orson, Mindy, Little, and he does the raspberry, and everyone who made Mork an Orkin again, because that's the way he really wants to be. Orson is glad to hear that. Mork learned a very important lesson. You can make your home anywhere in the universe, but it's most comfortable if you furnish it with your own traditions. And Mork feels best in early Mork like your early American interior decorating. He sends off and Bebo burbles. We've got that immigrant assimilation thing into the tag. I should mention that the end credits are pretty much like they were before, but we do see someone in pink fuzzy slippers, presumably Mindy, running from Bebo when it says Bebo as self. So we're starting out season three by trying to find a balance. And this applies to Mark, to the show, to scheduling with that Laverne and Shirley joke. 
a balance of tone. So it's kind of ironic that this one hour episode really does feel like two halves. And I have to say that the second half is stronger. I rate each of these episodes on a zero to four egg scale, which measures how much it delivers what I'm looking for in the series. This one, I felt like the first half, if it was on its own, would have been a two and a half. The second half is roughly three and a quarter, let's say 3.3. So that averages out to 2.9, not quite a three. Like I said, the daycare kids are all right. Not too memorable. Stephanie is somewhat Lola aside. Like I said, those four young people in the restaurant, <laughs> Remo, Jeannie, Nelson, Glenda Fay, don't really add much to the episode. Even the Fred material is kind of filler. I think it pays off in the second half though. They're just basically doing the setup. They are creating anticipation for the elder to show up and then the elder shows up just as my opinion of Glenda Fay has not really changed much since I was 12, I find the Elder one of the most delightful minor characters on this series. As I said, he does come back later in the season. He just really made an impression on me, much more than the daycare kids, actually. I like that he is this vaguely Robbie Wrist kind of looking kid with the mop top hair and glasses, but just delivering the lines with such seriousness and even gravitas. He's convinced convincing as a young looking elder. I should mention that the actor was Vidal I. Peterson, and I don't know his age, but I assume it was 10 or 11. His first appearance was on A is Enough, then his last was on Deep Space Nine in 93. There's the setup and he lives up to it, and I like seeing him face off with Mindy and with Mr. Bickley, and I like that we do get that little scene of Mr. Bickley, and Mr. Bickley still complaining about noise even when it's not that noisy, very in character. The elder is not a hard ass. He is willing to learn and to compromise and to sacrifice. So he is somebody that you could respect and look up to maybe more so than Orson. Although even Orson has a soft side in this. Not a fat joke. I'm just saying he is happy that Mork is saved. I do like what he brings to this episode. The second half is basically just the three of them, Mork, Mindy, and the Elder. That pretty much saves the episode for me. It makes it close to three. I also rate each of these episodes on a zero to four heart scale, which measures how well it supports the romantic relationship of Mork and Mindy. I'm going to go with a two and a half. As always with them, you could kind of see it as, oh, well, they're just very close platonic friends, but the fact that they're sort of in a bad marriage and and then also that they are so important to each other and they want to save and protect each other and sacrifice for each other. And they get flirty. There's some touching. The big kiss thing is not romantic, but we definitely have seen them kiss significantly and romantically and sometimes even passionately. It's definitely an episode about the past here at the midpoint. And we get that very nice montage to the way we were. Mindy reflecting on her relationship with Mark. And again, not romantic but they are really important to each other. He is stuck on her. She is the most important thing in the universe and she is starting to realize that they have, may have lost what made him him. I don't think that Mindy is in love with Moore. I feel like that's a slower process for her. I do think he's in love with her even by the end of season one, although he doesn't understand these feelings entirely. But she is strongly attached to him. So in a sense, what made her fall in like with him is being threatened above average, still could be stronger, but a good start. Although admittedly, season two started with a two and a half and stayed there for a while and then dropped off. But I like what I see of their relationship here. It's really nice. Season two started out very bizarrely with the not quite dream sequence, but the fantasy alternative world sequence. And here, although of course it's very sci-fi, it is mostly set in our world. It is questioning whether the influence of Earth, these aliens, if that's damaging to Morgan yet, his mission is still very important to him. I think he does still want to get this job done. He does still want to report on Earth, but Mindy matters more. And after all that in season two about the job hunt, we end up here where he's just got this job at the daycare, a different daycare, but he seems to have found the profession that he's going to stay with at least through the rest of the season and things get complicated in season four, of course. And we will have more episodes about that and we will see more of some of those daycare kids. And we've got the thing of Nelson's change of character. We don't know what he's going to do. I don't even know if he's still selling briefcases. We have 
the Da Vinci's with their new restaurant. I don't recall, but maybe that becomes the new hangout place. I do remember an episode that is about Mark befriending a husband and wife musical duo. And that was set at the restaurant. So we will see some with that. I'm hoping that we will get more with Mindy's college and journalism paths. Understandably, that doesn't come up this episode, but I think they will get back to that. So things are laid out. The path presumably will not be as zigzaggy as it was in season two, but don't hold me to that. Overall, an interesting start to the new season. 2.9 eggs, two and a half hearts. This is Paula Schaffner with episode 49, putting the orc back in mork. Life is like a kushbaya. <laughs>